Well, when you figure out what your question is, all of this later in our schedule and in the video library. But the House has gaveled back in for votes, so we'll take you there live here on C-SPAN. 2117. Will the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Emerson, kindly resume the chair? In the committee of the whole House of the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 2117, which the clerk will report by title. A bill to prohibit the Department of Education from overreaching into academic affairs and program eligibility under Title IV of the Higher Education Act of 1965. When the committee of the whole rose earlier today, a request for a recorded vote on Amendment Number 5. Printed in House Report 112-404 by the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, had it been postponed. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments printed in House Report 112-404, on which further proceedings were postponed in the following order. Amendment number one by Mr. Grijalva of Arizona. Amendment number four by Mr. Bishop of New York. Amendment number five by Mr. Polis of Colorado. The chair will reduce to two minutes the minimum time for any electronic vote after the first vote in this series. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on Amendment 1, printed in House Report 112-404 by the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Grijalva, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number one, printed in House Report number 112-404, offered by Mr. Gahalva of Arizona. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. Before a brief recess, the House had under consideration H.R. 2117, a bill that would overturn two recent Education Department rules dealing with institutes of higher learning. They will vote on three amendments here, and this first vote is 15 minutes, and it's by Representative Grijalva, a Democrat from Arizona. His amendment would retain the current regulations requiring states to have a plan to deal with student complaints against institutions. Two more amendment votes will follow. There will be five minute votes, but this first one is a 15 minute vote. And for some details on the bill, we spoke a short while ago to a Capitol Hill reporter. Libby Nelson is a reporter with Inside Higher Ed. The House is taking up a bill today that would overturn a couple of recent education department rules. What are the rules and why do House GOP leaders want to abolish them? The two rules are the state authorization rule, um, which requires that colleges obtain authorization from every state in which they operate, even if they're just enrolling a student in online classes, and the credit hour definition, um, which provides the first federal definition of what actually counts as a credit hour. Um, the GOP leaders are arguing that these regulations are overly burdensome um, and sort of represent federal overreach into higher education. Do the, would, would the, the rules apply, the rules of the Education Department uh, uh, wrote them apply to all colleges, whether they're public colleges or for-profit colleges? That's correct. These are part of the uh, program integrity rules that the department put forward last year. Um, some of them apply more to for-profit colleges than to nonprofit or public colleges, such as the gainful employment regulation. Um, but these two regulations do apply across the board in all sectors. In writing about the, the bill, you, you said that the, it's led to some strange bedfellows in terms of uh, support for the legislation. Who's supporting it? Uh, House Republicans are very much in favor of it. So are for-profit colleges, um, and so are nonprofit and public colleges, who more often sort of line up on the Democratic side of the aisle on things like uh, student aid and federal research spending. But they all have found common ground on this issue. The, you said that last week the White House, while not issuing a veto threat, said that it, quote, strongly opposed the bill. What's their opposition to the bill? And does the lack of a veto threat mean that there's some wiggle room there in allowing this bill to stand? 
I think it's too early to tell on, on what this lack of a specific veto threat means. Certainly the administration um, believes pretty strongly in their program integrity rules. They believe that these rules are necessary um, to stop abuses. They say by the for-profit sector um, of students or of federal financial aid. So there have been cases where credit hours have been inflated in order to get more financial aid. They say that they will prevent situations like that from occurring. In 2010 and 20, 2011, it seemed like uh, Senator Tom Harkin was the, the point man for some of the hearings and promulgating some of the action by the Education Department, particularly on the for-profit colleges. On the Senate side, is this likely to see uh, the light of day? And secondly, would there be a, a, a companion, uh, companion bill um, in the Senate? There has been a companion bill introduced. I think it's S-1297. It's currently in committee. Um, it, it hasn't been debated yet. So there is one out there that was introduced in June, I believe, about the same time this was voted on uh, by the House committee. I think, you know, the outcome of the vote will really tell whether this gets any traction with Senate Democrats. There are a few House Democrats um, who spoke in favor of the bill and a few who voted for it in committee. But certainly, as you say, Senator Harkin um, is likely to be opposed because of the for-profit angle to this. Find out more. Read, read uh, Libby Nelson's reporting at InsideHigherEd.com. Libby Nelson, thank you for the update. Thanks so much. And on the House floor, they're voting on the, the First Amendment vote here on, uh, the, on the bill we just uh, spoke to uh, Libby Nelson about. This is the Grijalva Amendment, which would retain current regulations that require states to have a plan to deal with student complaints against institutions. This is a 15-minute vote, and two more amendment votes will follow. There'll be five-minute votes, then we'll likely get a Democratic motion to recommit as well. The uh, House in today, the Senate in as well, and they are in session this afternoon. You can follow that on C-SPAN, too. Also, Road to the White House coverage coming up later today on the C-SPAN networks. It's Election Day, primary day in Michigan and Arizona, and after the polls close this evening, we will have victory and concession speeches, your phone calls and comments, all of that later tonight on the C-SPAN networks, C-SPAN radio and C-SPAN.org.
This afternoon, the House debated a bill that would overturn two recent Education Department rules dealing with higher education institutions. They've uh, gotten into roll call votes here, three amendment votes. This first one from Representative Grijalva of Arizona would retain current regulations that require states to have a plan to deal with student complaints against institutions. This first vote, 15 minutes, and the two following amendment votes will be two-minute votes. On the House floor, the first of three amendment votes on a bill that would repeal two recent Education Department rules dealing with institutes of higher learning. This is an amendment vote. The amendment proposed by Representative Grijalva of Arizona would retain current regulations that require states to have a plan to deal with student complaints against institutions. 
It's been a 15-minute vote. The next two amendment votes will be two-minute votes. And then we expect a Democratic motion to recommit. Also today, we expect the House to take up a, uh, a, bill, a bill that deals with uh, property rights and eminent domain issues in the wake of the uh, 2005 Supreme Court Kelo decision. Also today, President Obama speaking in Washington to the United Auto Workers Conference here in the nation's capital. We'll show that to you later in our schedule. We've also covered several uh, congressional hearings during, dealing with the uh, 2013 budget, Defense Department budget, the Interior, also EPA, all of those covered earlier today. Some of those you'll see this evening in our primetime schedule or later in the uh, schedule on the C-SPAN networks and certainly later in the video library at cspan.org. A series of votes here dealing with the bill they debated earlier on the edu education department rules. And when they finish this up, they'll take up a bill that, uh, that deals with property rights and eminent domain issues in the wake of the uh, Supreme Court 2005 Kelo decision. We spoke to a Capitol Hill reporter for a preview. We are joined by Joanna Anderson of Congressional Quarterly. Why are House Republicans pursuing a bill that's aimed at limiting the government's use of eminent domain authority? Well, essentially this whole debate um, goes back to a, a Supreme Court decision in 2005 um, that was really met with, with quite a bit of criticism from, uh, from both sides of the aisle. And what that decision said, um, uh, it simply said that the Connecticut city of New London could exercise its uh, eminent domain power um, to force uh, some homeowners to vacate their property to make way for, for commercial development. Um, and really, uh, since then, that has received criticism that, uh, you know, that's essentially taking away private property rights uh, unnecessarily. How much support is, in there, is there going to be when the, uh, the, the bill comes up for a final vote? Well, I would say it's expected to have quite a bit of support um, from, from both Democrats and Republicans. It um, went through the Judiciary Committee uh, uh, late last month um, and was a, was a 23 to 5 vote, so that's pretty strong support there. Um, and it has passed the House uh, before, not long after the, the Supreme Court decision in 2005. Are there opponents? And if so, what are they saying in opposition to the bill? You know, there really isn't um, much opposition, um, it looks like, in Congress right now. Um, the, the sort of the opposing argument set forth by the court um, was that uh, the, the, um, the making way for, for the economic development was, was enough of a public use um, to, to warrant the use of eminent domain. So that decision by the Supreme Court was 2005. Here, seven years later, they're taking up this bill in the House. What's it look like in the Senate? And if it passes Congress, what impact would it have on that 2005 decision? Would it reverse it? Uh, well, well, first of all, on the, on, um, the Senate, it's, it's, it's looking likely that it will that that probably get through the House. Um, but again, it, it did last time and, and got, got stuck up in the Senate. Um, so it's, it's a bit of an open question over there still. Um, there isn't a companion bill moving at this point. Um, and it essentially, it is, it is sort of targeting that ruling specifically. It would, um, it, it would make states and localities receiving federal economic funds they wouldn't be allowed to essentially exercise this, this type of eminent domain authority and, you know, they're essentially cutting off federal funds to these places um, for a period of two years um, if they violate this. So, um, uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner, who's sponsoring the bill, um, he has said that, that's, that that would serve as a strong uh, a disincentive for states and localities to, to use this type of authority. An update on the House's eminent domain bill from Joanna Anderson with Congressional Quarterly. Read more at CQ.com. Thanks for the update. Thank you. 
House will take that bill up uh, later this afternoon. That should do it for legislative work. Here on the floor now, they are finishing up the first of three amendment votes related to a bill that would overturn two education department rules for higher education institutions. This is Raul Grijalva's uh, amendment, which would retain current regulations that require states to have a plan to deal with student complaints against an institution. Two more amendment votes will follow, a Democratic motion to recommit and final passage, and then they will take up that, uh, that eminent domain bill. Over in the Senate today, there's been some talk of uh, debate on the transportation bill, some talk about the transportation bill itself, but no, feel, no, no real moving forward on it. This is the uh, Congressional Quarterly Reports this afternoon that House Republican leaders are delaying action on a downsized multi-year transportation reauthorization, even after Speaker Boehner was forced last week to abandon his signature longer-term bill that also links infrastructure programs with energy production. CQ writes that House leaders will not, as expected, bring to the floor a two-year extension of the transportation programs that they expire at the end of next month. One factor is the continuing intraparty divisions on how to advance even the more limited version. The Senate continues debate, as we mentioned, on their version. Theirs is a two-year, $109 billion. So some talk, talk of that in the Senate, and the Senate is in session this afternoon. You can follow that on C-SPAN 2.
On this vote, the yeas are 170, the nays are 247. The amendment is not adopted. House will be in order. The House will be in order. Will all members please take seats? House will be in order. House will be in order. Will all members please take seats or take conversations off the floor? For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio rise? Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for one minute. Gentleman's recognized. I, I thank the speaker and I thank my colleagues for their attention. Uh, Madam Speaker, sadly, in a set of occurrences that is becoming all too frequent in our country, yesterday at 7.40 a.m. in the town of Chardon, Ohio, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with our part of the world, about 25 miles east of Cleveland, uh, allegedly, a student uh, brought a gun into the cafeteria of the high school, opened fire, and shot uh, five of the students. As I stand here today, uh, three uh, of those students have succumbed to the injuries received and have passed away. Uh, two continue to be under medical care. Uh, I would indicate that uh, in these tragedies, uh, there are also uh, items of heroism. And an assistant coach at Chardon High School, Frank Hall, uh, chased the gunman out of the high school at great risk to himself, but perhaps saving further tragedy. So, Madam Speaker, on behalf of uh, all of my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats in the state of Ohio, uh, I would ask the House to observe a moment of silence in honor of the fallen, the staff at the school, uh, their families, uh, and the city of Chardon. Please observe a moment of silence. I thank the chair. Two minute voting. Without objection, two minute voting will continue. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on Amendment 4, printed in House Report 112 404 by the gentleman from New York, Mr. Bishop, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number four, printed in House Report number 112-404, offered by Mr. Bishop of New York. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. Sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. Representative Steve LaTourette of Ohio calling for a moment of silence on the uh, shooting yesterday in Chardon, Ohio. Officials at a Cleveland hospital say a student who had been in critical condition died this morning. The teenager who was under arrest in the attack is facing an afternoon hearing in juvenile court. On the House floor, the second of three amendment votes on a bill that would overturn two education department rules dealing with institutions of higher learning. Tim Bishop's, Tim Bishop's amendment would strike the language in the bill that prohibits the education department 
from defining the term credit hour. Libby Nelson in uh, Inside Higher Ed writes that students qualify for less federal financial aid when a program is measured in clock hours. Programs that typically do so include training for truck drivers, pilots, cosmetologists, and other occupations where licensing requires students to log hours. Degree programs, she writes, typically measure in credit hours. On this vote, the yeas are 160, the nays are 255. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on Amendment 5, printed in House Report 112404 by the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the ayes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in House Report number 112-404, offered by Mr. Polis of Colorado. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a for recorded vote will rise and be counted. Sufficient number having risen of recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. Chair Polis's amendment would require the Education Department to submit a plan to Congress on how to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. And again, the underlying legislation would overturn educa two Education Department rules dealing with higher education institutions. This is the last amendment vote. We expect a Democratic motion to recommit and final passage ahead. We also expect the House to take up a bill this afternoon 
on uh, eminent domain issues and property rights, but they won't complete that or are likely not to complete work on that with uh, instead in rolling a vote into tomorrow if it's called for. On this vote, the yeas are 199, the nays are 217. The amendment is not adopted. Question is on the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted accordingly. Under the rule, the committee rises. On the State of the Union reports the committee has under consideration the bill HR 2117 and pursuant to House Resolution 563 reports the bill back to the House with an amendment adopted in the Committee of the Whole. Under the rule, the previous question is ordered. In a separate vote, demanded on the amendment to the amendment reported from the Committee of the Whole. If not, the question is on the adoption of the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it.
The amendment is agreed to. The question is on engrossment in third reading of the bill. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. The ayes have it. Third reading. A bill to prohibit the Department of Education from overreaching into academic affairs and program eligibility under Title IV of the Higher Education Act of 1965. The House will be in order. If members would please clear the well and take their conversations from the floor. But what for what purpose does the gentlewoman from California rise? Mr. Speaker, I have a motion to re uh, recommit at the desk. Is the gentlewoman opposed to the bill? Yes, I am opposed. The gentlewoman qualifies. The clerk will report the motion. Mrs. Capps of California moves to recommit the bill, H.R. 2117, to the Committee on Education and Labor with instructions to report the same back to the House forthwith with the following amendment. At the end of the bill, add the following. C protecting students from higher loan costs and a devalued educational degree. Nothing in subsection B shall limit the authority of the Secretary of Education to promulgate or enforce any regulation or rule under Title IV of the Higher Education Act of 1965. One, for the purpose of reducing the cost of higher education for students or two, during any year in which the interest rate for subsidized direct federal Stafford loans used to purchase credit hours under such title is higher than 3.4 percent. The House will be in order. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, there are many times when we come to this floor and engage in heated debate, and we have heard some heated debate on this bill. But my final amendment offers us the opportunity to come together and to do something extraordinarily important, to contain the escalating costs of higher education. I want to be clear, passing this amendment will not prevent the passing of the underlying bill. If it's adopted, my amendment will be incorporated into the bill, and the bill will be immediately voted upon. The House is not in order. The gentleman is correct. The gentlewoman deserves to be heard. The gentlewoman may continue. Regardless of one, how one feels about the bill, we should all agree on a major problem facing students and their families. I'm talking about the skyrocketing cost of higher education, putting the American dream way out of reach for far too many students. Mr. Speaker, my final amendment is very simple. It says that nothing in this bill should limit the Secretary's ability to reduce the cost of higher education for students. In 2007, Democrats, working with President Bush, lowered the interest rate on need-based student loans to 3.4 percent at no cost to taxpayers. This change is saving college graduates thousands of dollars in student loan payments. But unless we act soon, the interest rates on these loans will double this summer. That will cost them more than 7 million student borrowers at colleges and universities across the country more than $2,800 in additional interest payments. Mr. Speaker, students cannot afford graduating from college with mortgage-sized debt. Student loan debt now surpasses overall credit card debt. We can do something about this. We need our graduates to be developing the next clean energy source, discovering the cures for life-threatening diseases. We need them to fill vital jobs in our community, such as nurses, teachers, firefighters, and police. We don't need them to leave school overwhelmed by student loan payments, and we don't want them avoiding higher education in the first place due to the threat of crushing debt. Instead, we should make sure they are prepared for good-paying jobs in the market, in the global marketplace. And we can do that by making college more affordable. But incredibly, this bill limits the Education Secretary's ability to protect students and taxpayers from higher education costs. With more than $200 billion in aid distributed each year, the Secretary must have the tools to lower costs for students and their families and to protect our nation's investments in education. We shouldn't be tying the Secretary's hands at a time when we must be utilizing every tool available to keep college costs down. And in particular, 
We should not do this while students face a potential doubling of interest rates on their loans, which will happen this summer if Congress doesn't take action now. The cost of borrowing for a student loan is already too high. Let's not make the problem worse. Again, my amendment simply states that nothing in the bill shall limit the Secretary's ability to reduce the cost of higher education for students, something we can all agree upon. So I urge a vote to lower costs for students and hard-working American families, and I'm pleased to yield to my distinguished colleague from California, George Miller. I thank you, gentlemen, for yielding, and I thank you for offering this motion to recommit. I say to my colleagues here in the House, this is a very simple proposition. If Congress fails to act in July of this year, interest rates on student loans will double. And if those interest rates on student loan double, that means that the average borrower will pay another $2,800, almost $3,000 in additional interest. At a time when families and students will, will be paying higher interest rates than any time in the recent past, we ought to make sure that the Secretary has the authority to make, that they understand that they get value for what they're buying that they don't get overcharged, that they're not the subject of, of fraud and abuse and the waste in the system when people try to overcharge them for the number of units that they're offering them. We cannot let these students go into this area unprotected when interest rates are about to double. Congress can, Congress can solve this problem by, by retaining the interest rates at three and, a, at three and a quarter percent and be done with this issue and, and, the, and the legislation will go forward. But if we don't protect the, the students and their families from the increase in interest rates, then the Secretary re retains the authority to make sure that they're not subject to waste, fraud, and abuse when they're borrowing money to pay for their education. I thank the gentlewoman for introducing her legislation. Thank you. I urge a yes vote on the motion to recommit, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlewoman yields back. What purpose does a gentlewoman from North Carolina rise? Uh, I am opposed to the um, motion to recommit. Gentle, gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I reserve all points of order against the motion. Mr. Speaker, we don't need this motion to recommit. My colleagues should all vote against it. We have a situation where our colleagues across the aisle want to take the Secretary of Education and make him the czar of education. We on our side of the aisle are very much concerned about the cost of a college education and we've done a lot to make college accessible and affordable for students in this country. However, increasing rules and regulations simply increases... Gentleman is correct. The House will be in order. Gentlewoman may continue. Mr. Speaker, would you please ask the House to be in order again? Gentlewoman deserves to be heard. Members, would please take their conversations from the floor. The gentlewoman may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Republicans are very much concerned about the cost of going to college ourselves. We want to reduce the, ro the cost of going to college. Our subcommittee has had hearings on this. There are many ways to do this, but having the federal government establish price controls is not the way to do it. The federal government, in fact, has encouraged too much borrowing. Because the federal government has been such a big borrower itself, it has established that kind of mentality across the country. So we'd like to see the uh, level of borrowing reduced. We'd like to see the level of uh, de and deficit go down so that the economy would rebound, people could get jobs, and those who do have debt would be able to better deal with that debt. We do not need more government rules and regulations. We don't need the federal government picking winners and losers, and we don't need this kind of, regula this kind of authority ceded to the Secretary of the Department of Education. The Congress needs to be dealing with these issues. We are dealing with the issues. The underlying bill deals with the issues because we reduced the role of the federal government and rules and regulations. Higher education has policed itself very well over the years. We need to pass the bill, the underlying bill, and reject the motion to recommit. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlewoman yields back. Without objection, the previous question is ordered. The question is on the motion to recommit. Those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Those opposed will say no. no. The no's have it. I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, the chair will reduce to five minutes the minimum time for any electronic vote on the question of passage. This will be a 15-minute vote. This is the Democratic motion to recommit the last chance to change the bill on a bill that would repeal the minimum standards for state authorization of for-profit schools within that state. It would also repeal the rules definition, definition, the Education Department rule definition of the term credit hour and prohibit the Education Department from drafting or implementing any new regulation that defines that term. So 15-minute vote here on this motion to recommit and final passage vote is next. On Capitol Hill today, on the C-SPAN networks, we covered a number of uh, 2013, fiscal year 2013 budget hearings, including Secretary of the Interior Salazar talking about his department's proposed budget for fiscal year 2013. Mary Landrieu, Democratic Senator from New York, asked him a number of questions about oil and gas production. We're going to show you a portion of that portion of the hearing as this 15-minute vote continues. Senator Landrieu. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. And Mr. Secretary, um, thank you for your you know, focus and interest um, in the Gulf Coast and your many visits down and your commitment uh, to uh, the restoration of our region and um, the investments in our national parks and state parks. And I know that you have a passion for conservation, and we appreciate that. But I want to um, add my voice to try to clarify that, in fact, the oil and gas production in our country, as you've just tried to explain, is lower than it has ever been on federal lands, both offshore and onshore. And the increase has come from production on private land. Now, those are the facts. I'm not arguing about the price of gas, and I would say to my Republican colleagues that they should know that we can't drill our way out of this problem. We cannot drill our way back to $2 or $3 gasoline. And I don't want to engage in bumper sticker politics, but I do want to engage in good policy for this country. And speaking from Louisiana's perspective, we need to get a more aggressive drilling policy in this country. We can't drill our way out, but we most certainly can create jobs. We most certainly can strengthen the U.S. Um, independence. We most certainly can reduce our reliance on foreign oil. And the facts are that drilling on public lands are down and they need to be increased. The other fact is, contrary to the inference that we are drilling everywhere we can in the outer continental shelf, you know, Mr. Secretary, the facts are these. We are drilling on less than 2% of the OCS. Two percent. Now only a small portion is leasable and of that leasable portion we're drilling on two percent. The OCS is 200 miles wide and it goes from Oregon to Maine and we're drilling on less than two percent. So I just think that it's important for us to be clear about what our situation is. In addition, I want to say that Despite the administration's arguments that are laid out that you all are all guns blaring and green lights for drilling, the facts that I checked, and if you disagree, tell me, only 21 permits for offshore drilling have been issued by this date. In 2010, there were 32 permits. I just left the annual conference of LOGO, which is Louisiana Oil and Gas Association, Mr. Secretary, yesterday. They are beside themselves with not being able to get their permits processed. And to answer you, Mr. Franken, let me just say that Exxon and Shell may be making record profits, but according to a study recently done by the Greater New Orleans Inc., 41% of our oil and gas independent operators and service companies, I'm not talking about Exxon and Shell that have operations all over the world, 
I'm talking about companies in the Gulf Coast, in Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. Let me tell you what the, the studies show about their profits. 41% of them are not making a profit at all. 70% have lost significant cash reserves. 46 have moved operations away from the Gulf, and 82% of business owners have lost personal savings as a result of this slowdown. Now, part of it is the accident, and part of it is the permatorium. I have to continue to express this to you, privately and publicly. I know what you're trying to do, and you're making statements about increasing production, but I can tell you the reality in the Gulf Coast is not there. So that is one point that I wanted to make. Secondly, and I'll get to a question in a minute, um, this 4% of an acre is being proposed for non-producing leases. Can you explain where that, how much money that would raise, where it would be going? Because we're already experiencing an increase of fees, a decrease in permits. We don't know if that money is coming from us and going elsewhere to promote what we don't know. But we need more inspectors to get our permits and our drilling underway in places that the people support drilling and the country needs the jobs. Where is the four cents going to go and how much is it going to raise? Well, well, Senator Landrieu, let me first say I, I disagree with your conclusions. Uh, we, the fact is uh, when uh, you've lived through a national crisis, uh, I think it's very responsible that we have moved forward now with the approval and just last year over 100 shallow well permits, uh, 60 deep water permits, and the rigs are back and working is, uh, is very uh, much a public knowledge. And uh, I've answered, uh, we, we feel very comfortable in terms of the production that is uh, coming off of uh, our public lands both onshore and offshore. And I'm going to have the Deputy Secretary make just a quick comment on that as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Very quickly, on the onshore, um, we have 38 million acres available for leasing right now. Only 16 million are, in fact, uh, being uh, leased. Last year, we had 32 onshore lease sales offering 4.4. I realize that, but Mr. Hayes, not to interrupt you, Mr. Chairman, it's not about what percentage you have under production that are leased. If you said how much land you have in the United States, on public lands and then took your percentage of what is leasable and then took your percentage of what is drilled, you'd give the people of this country a better picture. Again, and I'm not an expert on onshore, but I am on offshore. Well, Two percent of the OCS is being drilled. Do you agree with that or not? Because those are the facts. Um, Two percent of the entire land of the OCS, yes or no? We, we've made available 75 percent of the reserve. That is not what I'm asking. We are not leasing areas where there is no oil okay, in the offshore. Okay, and what percent of the entire OCS of this country is being drilled on right now? What is the I, percentage? Let me, let me take that, David. Here's Mary, Senator Landrieu. The fact of the matter is that there are tens, and I think it's, uh, maybe it's, it's it, it is, uh, it is over 30, 40 million acres that we just did in the one lease sale. There's more that will be leased. The lease sale that I did in New Orleans in December, uh, I think was 38 million acres, about you 2 know, million acres of it was leased. Mr. Secretary, so when you, when, you, when you make available in one lease sale uh, tens of millions of acres, and you have some of it that's a bid on, the companies are going where they know the oil and gas Mr. is. So Secretary, the fact is we are moving forward with a very robust We are never going to get, in my view, Mr. Chairman, we're never going to get clear as long as we continue to talk around and throw statistics out that try to make both sides look good. I'm not trying to make you look any worse. I'm just trying to get the facts out to the public. You, the, when you speak, you get people thinking that we're drilling everywhere, onshore and offshore, and the facts are not don't justify that. You know that 98% of our offshore is limited to drilling. We can't even explore there. We're talking about what we're drilling within that 2%. And my final point, and I'll say this, Mr. Chairman, you've been very good to me. I, as a senator from Louisiana, have to come to this meeting every year, and I've now looked at my notes to find out that Wyoming last year got $1.7 billion in royalties. The, ch the senator is not here, but I want my colleagues to know. The state of Wyoming has 500,000 people. They got $1.7 billion that they kept. I don't know what they're doing with that money. I don't know if they're preserving land or conservation. 
Louisiana, which produces more oil and gas than they have off of our shore, has more infrastructure, got $160 million, and we have 4.5 million people. Mr. Chairman, this is the greatest injustice to the Gulf Coast of this United States, and I hope nobody puts a revenue-sharing bill anywhere around this committee because this senator will fight to the end. No state is going to be treated like our state, and we've been treated like this since 1920. Louisiana Senator Mary Landrieu and Interior Secretary Ken Salazar. From a hearing we covered earlier today, you'll see it later in our program schedule and certainly later in our video library at cspan.org. Back on the House floor live, this is the motion to recommit vote, a last chance to change the bill before final passage, and that bill is H.R. 2117, a bill that would overturn two recent Education Department rules dealing with institutions of higher learning. Also on the way, the final passage vote would be next, and uh, also a debate, 40 minutes of debate on a bill that would uh, bar the use of eminent domain by states or local governments for the purposes of economic development. We get a preview to that debate from a Capitol Hill reporter. We are joined by Joanna Anderson of Congressional Quarterly. Why are House Republicans pursuing a bill that's aimed at limiting the government's use of eminent domain authority? Well, essentially this whole debate um, goes back to a, a Supreme Court decision in 2005 um, that was really met with, with quite a bit of criticism from, uh, from both sides of the aisle. And what that decision said, um, uh, it essentially said that the Connecticut city of New London could exercise its uh, eminent domain power um, to force uh, some homeowners to vacate their property to make way for, for commercial development. Um, and really, uh, since then, that has received criticism that, uh, you know, that's essentially taking away private property rights uh, unnecessarily. How much support is, in there, is there going to be when the, uh, the, the bill comes up for a final vote? Well, I would say it's expected to have quite a bit of support um, from, from both Democrats and Republicans. It um, went through the Judiciary Committee uh, uh, late last month um, and was a, was a 23 to 5 vote, so that's pretty strong support there. Um, and it has passed the House uh, before, not long after the, the Supreme Court decision in 2005. Are there opponents, and if so, what are they saying in opposition to the bill? You know, there really isn't um, much opposition, um, it looks like, in Congress right now. Um, the, the sort of the opposing argument set forth by the court um, was that uh, the, the, um, the making way for, for the economic development was, was enough of a public use um, to, to warrant the use of eminent domain. So that decision by the Supreme Court was 2005. Here, seven years later, they're taking up this bill in the House. What's it look like in the Senate? And if it passes Congress, what impact would it have on that 2005 decision? Would it reverse it? Uh, well, well, first of all, on the, on, um, the Senate, it's, it's, it's looking likely that it will that probably get through the House. Um, but again, it, it did last time and, and got, got stuck up in the Senate. Um, so it's, it's a bit of an open question over there still. Um, there isn't a companion bill moving at this point. Um, and it essentially, it is, it is sort of targeting that ruling specifically. It would, um, it, it would make states and localities receiving federal economic funds, uh, they wouldn't be allowed to essentially exercise this, this type of eminent domain authority. And, you know, they're essentially cutting off federal funds to these places um, for a period of two years um, if they violate this. So um, uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner, who's sponsoring the bill, um, he has said that that's, that, that would serve as a strong uh, a disincentive for states and localities to, to use this type of authority. An update on the House's eminent domain bill from Joanna Anderson with Congressional Quarterly. Read more at CQ.com. Thanks for the update. Thank you. And debate on that eminent domain bill coming up later this afternoon. First, the House has to finish up work on a bill they debated earlier. This is the motion to recommit vote and final passage is next on a bill that would repeal the definition of a credit hour and also end the uh, education department requirement that colleges obtain authorization to operate in every state in which they enroll students in online classes. That will be a, uh, a five-minute vote next. This has been a 15-minute vote. Over in the Senate, meanwhile, it looks like tomorrow they'll move forward with a debate on the transportation bill. The Hill's uh, Keith Lang, the transportation reporter, writes that Senator Reid said this afternoon he would reopen debate on the $109 billion trans transportation bill. 
a bill which would fund road and transit projects over a two-year period. It's been held up since before President's Day recess over amendments that supporters have said are not germane to the highway bill. That said, CQ reports that they will vote on an amendment by Missouri Republican Roy Blunt that would allow health insurance plans to decline to cover an item if it's against the issuer's religious beliefs. That vote tomorrow in the Senate, part of the transportation debate, and you can follow that, of course, on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. On this vote, the yeas are 176, the days are 241. The motion is not adopted. The question is on passage of the bill. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say aye.